That's right, people. That one panel in one comic book speaks the truth. And what is the truth? I'm going to tell you right now. The truth, as far as I've been able to recall and deduce, is de-evolution. And if you people have known me for more than 15 minutes, you'll know that I am a firm believer in the theory of de-evolution, which is why I, your pal Malcolm Tent, am absolutely delighted to have back in the hot seat for his second go-round on the Malcolm Tent shoot interview, Mr. Bob Lewis, co-founder of Devo. Hello, Bob. Hello, Malcolm. Good to be here. It is great to have you, Mang. Um, anybody who did not see the first shoot interview that we did with Bob Lewis, I got to tell you right now, unless you're watching live, go to my YouTube channel right now and watch the first interview we did, get the background, because we went deep into the philosophical and educational underpinnings of Devo and the theory thereof. So get your background and now tune back in and hear what we have to say. Whew, I'm gonna turn it right over to you, Bob. You've apparently got some stories and things to show. Well, yeah, I was thinking about some things that people might be interested in. And there was, there was one uh, road trip, early road trip that, uh, that at, had a lot of, of highlights in it. And it was, it was kind of an extensive trip because um, in a we had, uh, in addition to the equipment and the band, we also had 5,000 copies of uh, the um, Giacomo single that we're, we were delivering to Stiff Records in New York. So the band was completely, the van was completely packed up. And so, and I had a uh, 1966 Oldsmobile Holiday 88, which actually appears in a couple of the, of the songs, that Oldsmobile, that was the car we were talking about. So anyway, um, so we, d we drove from Akron, to, the first stop was Philadelphia, where we were playing the Hot Club on South Street. Now, uh, people of my generation may recognize South Street as, as there was a, a song called Where Do All the Hippies Meet? South Street, South Street, where the dancing is elite. And that was from a Philadelphia band. And as far as I know, that is the first mention of hippie, hippiedom uh, in popular music. I may be wrong if anybody knows anything earlier, but that's the earliest that I can remember. So we were going to the hot club on South Street. So we pull up, it's about four in the afternoon and we pull up, we've got the van and then we pull up in my Oldsmobile and we get out of the car and we go lock the car. We go inside to see where we're supposed to load equipment in. So we're in there, we're talking to, to the guy that's managing the club and we're in there about three minutes. We walk back outside. Somebody has forced open the vent window of the Oldsmobile, opened the car and stolen all my clothes and all Jerry's clothes and all of our luggage. So it was welcome to the city of brotherly love. Within five minutes, the hyenas had descended upon us and picked our bones clean because we were the rubes from the Midwest. So anyway, so we played, we played, we played the gig last uh, that night, and uh, uh, as I recall, um, the manager of the club, who was really kind of a sleazy guy, he let us use his office as our uh, dressing room. So Jerry's poking around in, in the guy's closet and up on the top shelf is a bottle of Napoleon brandy, like 1898 bottle of Napoleon brandy, which accompanied us on the trip from Philadelphia to New York City. So, so we're driving, we're driving from um, Philadelphia to New York, which means you have to go on the New Jersey turnpike. And so the, the van is driving ahead of us and then there's my car. And so I'm like about two car lengths behind. We're driving together. We're driving on the New Jersey Turnpike 
and all of a sudden I noticed there's like these New Jersey State Highway Patrol cars. There's like about six of them, three on each side. And they come up alongside of us, and then they kind of turn into a Chevron and they pull us, pull both vehicles over to the side of the road. And they get out of the car and they got guns in their hands. And we're like, what the hell is going on? So they come up and say, what's in the van? And we say, well, uh, record equipment. And we got some records, you know, we got like musical equipment and records. And they said, open it up, let's see. What we didn't know is that this was the route that the cigarette smugglers, they would go down to North Carolina and Virginia and buy cigarettes with no tax. And then they'd fill a van with the cigarettes and drive them to New York City, where, where so th thus avoiding a buck and a half per, per pack of cigarettes tax or something like that. So once we unloaded the van and opened up the boxes to show they were records and it wasn't cigarettes, they were okay. But it was a, it was a little bit scary. Uh, yeah, you were probably worried about that bottle of Napoleon brandy. Brandy, that's right. Well, I think it was probably gone by then, but <laughs> but, but well, anyway, you know, that was. I was going to say, true, interesting fact. One of the great professional wrestlers uh, in the WWF, Dino Bravo, was a cigarette smuggler, and they found him with, I think, twenty-seven bullets in his head because he crossed the wrong cigarette smuggler. So you guys <laughs> got a right. <laughs> The cigarette cabal uh, uh, got him. Ooh, yeah. Usually they do it longer term with uh, lung cancer, but you know, in certain instances, they'll, they'll come right out. Right. <laughs> so, so uh, you got any questions, anything you'd like to talk about? Oh, where to even begin? Where to even begin? Well, I think that your average viewer of this little interview is going to know that the basic history of Devo and the band and the art and all that. So I'm not, we're not going to go too heavily into that. I'm just going to start asking you the real hardcore fanboy questions. And okay. we're, we're going to like, we're going to bowl a 300. So, okay. We're going to go back to the early seventies at Kent State University. Okay. 69, 70, 70, you know, 71, whatever. You've got this loose aggregate of people hanging out at the commuter's lounge at Kent State University yes. under this loose umbrella of a thing called Devo. There's music being written and played and in some cases recorded. There's art being made and being shown. There's writings being written and published. There's philosophical discussions. To what end was all of, all of this activity directed at? Well, I think, you know, it was, it was changing. And the, the, the um, how does Malcolm Gladwell say, the, uh, the tipping point, the, uh, the tipping point was, of course, May 4th, 1970. Um, and let me go back and give a little history of like uh, uh, anti-war and leftist uh, uh, background for Kent State. Cause I mean, when I was in high school, you know, we pretty much got propagandized and Vietnam was not like a big deal yet. So it was kind of like, we may have to go over there and kick the commies butt, you know? And so when I was in high school, I was like prepared to join the Marines and go kill commies or something like that, you know, who knows? Then you get to college and you start to hear a little different point. And so I started at Kent in the fall of 1965. In the spring of, I think it was 1966, there was like this small group formed called the Kent Committee to End the War in Vietnam. And there were six or seven people. They would be outside the student union protesting. This is like probably late spring of 1966. You know, and there's six or seven people and the jocks and the frat boys are making fun of them. And yeah, you're commies and, you know, love it or leave it and yelling at them and stuff like that. And what's really weird, if you see some photos of these original protesters, they have like um, 
Princeton haircuts and skinny ties and tweed sport coats on. I mean, they look like junior professors. That's the radicals. Now, two years later, if you photograph the same people, they would be in like olive drab with Castro beards. And so, but it, it, it just, the change was, was so remarkable. So this is like pre-SDS. Now, one of the founders of SDS name was uh, Carl Oglesby. And he, he and Tom Hayden were the guys who drafted the Port Huron document, which was basically, you know, a formative statement of the, this is our goals, this is what we want to do. Um, and he was from Akron and, and he knew a lot of people at Kent. So he would show up occasionally. And so I think, I think Kent was really pretty early on in getting a sub chapter of, of, of SDS, you know, after, after the protest started. And then uh, I remember in like uh, April of April of 1967, there was a big anti-war march in New York City. And about, I don't know, about six or seven of us piled into a Rambler wagon and we drove to, uh, to New York City and stayed at a, I think it was a Howard Johnson motel, just, you know, sleeping on the floor and stuff, six or eight people in the room. Then the next day there was a march up uh, Fifth Avenue, and there were, it was the first real big East Coast march. And so there were probably 450,000 people marching uh, up, up Fifth Avenue. And when they got to Central Park, then there was a, um, a protest there where a lot of people burned their draft cards. Uh, and then of course, you know, after that, there were other uh, uh, protests. There was a protest at the Pentagon, when, when they tried to levitate the Pentagon and, you know, some, so, and of course there were protests in, in Berkeley and on the West Coast. Uh, and of course, the farther we got into the war uh, and the more Americans were dying uh, and the more people were getting drafted and shipped overseas, uh, there was a kind of a compelling focus uh, for college students to like get involved in in saying we we're not thinking this is a good idea. Uh, uh, as Muhammad Ali said, you know, Viet Cong never did nothing to me. <laughs> you know, they never called me a nigger. <laughs> I think is what he actually said. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh. And Kent State for for being a you know a kind of a uh, just a regional state academic uh, institution you know it, it's it's not like it was Ann Arbor or Columbia or Berkeley, but there was a pretty active crew there, and and then in like 1968 or 1969, there were two uh, two groups came to recruit on the, the Kent State campus. And one was the CIA and the other was the Oakland police who were at the time engaged in trying to exterminate the Black Panthers. Hmm. So the Black United students at Kent and the SDS kind of had a joint protest uh, for, and to try to stop the ability of the Oakland police to recruit. And they kind of successfully threw a wrench into the works, but, in the, in the course of that, uh, some students uh, were identified as having had like uh, um, leading roles in, in, in the illegal protest on the campus. And so, and I believe it was the following spring, there was supposed to be an administrative hearing to determine if, if these people in a I believe one was uh, Jim uh, Powery, who uh, I grew up down the street from him, and he was in SDS, and a guy named Howie Emmer from Cleveland, who was uh, uh, active in SDS, and about four other people. They were going to have this disciplinary hearing, and the disciplinary hearing was supposed to be in the um, on front campus in the administrative building, and at the last minute they moved that to music and speech, which was a standalone building on back campus. Nobody really understood why they would, why they would do that. 
but that's what happened. So, so what happened was uh, a bunch of people then went to back campus and they wanted to get into the hearing and somebody had locked the doors, So they forced the doors and then went in and upstairs because the hearings were going to be on the third floor, I believe. Well, as soon as enough people got inside, apparently the basement of, of the building had been filled with uh, uh, police and they kind of came up out of the basements and they track trapped uh, about 200 people upstairs and they were going to go up and arrest them all. Now, unbeknownst to the police, there was a faculty member who had a key to the elevator. And so he started taking people down and and out, but uh, but uh, a number of people did get arrested and that's known as the music and speech incident. Uh, and just for the record, it was the, the brainchild of a guy named uh, Ronald Roskins who was the provo at Kent at the time. And he was also the provo uh, on May 4th. Now, in the early 60s, there was a cheating scandal at Kent involving the fraternities where they would break into the offices of the professors and steal exams and make copies of the exams and then distribute them among their fraternity buddies for a fee. You know, so they were making money off of selling test answers. For a fee. We'll just we'll just make sure yeah. that's underlined for a fee. Yeah. 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 So, so Roskins busted these guys. But what he did, rather than expel them, he turned them into narcs. He turned them into his his agents who, and he kept, and also he worked with the campus police. So if you were a student and got busted with, you know, a minor amount of pot on you, maybe you didn't get thrown out of school if you were willing to work with Roskins. And so, and, We'll go back to this later after after we talk a little bit about May 4th. Okay, so now let's jump ahead to May 4th. Actually, a, a few days before May 4th. On the Thursday, May 4th was a Monday. So let's see, Monday, Sunday's the third. Say that. So on, oh, it must have been on Thursday, which would have been the end of April, like April 31st. Nixon comes on TV and he announces that uh, the U.S. is expanding the war in uh, Cambodia because the um, Viet Cong haven't been playing fair, and they go across the border into Cambodia, uh, escaping uh, escaping justice, and and so we had to expand the war into Cambodia. And so the next day, that was that was kind of you know people came uh, came back to school and they were really ticked off and upset, and there were like people spray spray painted stuff on on uh, fences downtown and stuff like that. And then that night, uh, that night uh, down on Water Street in the bars, there were there were some protests. They made a bonfire in the middle of the street and, you know, uh, and at some point then the Kent police showed up in their riot squad gear with batons and and stuff like that. And for some reason, they decided it'd be smart to go into the bars and shut down the bars and force everybody out of the bars and onto the street I'd, at like 11 o'clock instead of waiting to closing time. Well, all this did is enrage about, you know, 1,500 students, something like that. And so then there was some, some damage to, to the downtown. They broke some windows and some stuff like that, which really ticked off the townspeople. So now that's Friday night. Then Saturday night, uh, Saturday night, the the National Guard shows up late Saturday afternoon, and uh, I was at the uh, I was at the the Kent Film Festival uh, was going on, and that was right in the center of campus. So uh, and there were. There was an early show, like from eight to ten, a late show from ten to twelve. So we went to the early show and we came out of the the film festival at uh, ten o'clock, and there was a cluster of uh, wooden barracks that had been built 
on campus during World War II that were used as, as art buildings. And then one of them was the uh, Kent chapter of ROTC. And uh, somebody had, uh, had tried to set the ROTC, ROTC building on fire. The firemen came, they got it under control. Then apparently, supposedly a group of students cut, cut the fire hoses. Uh, I think it's more likely that someone decided to let it burn. So anyway, that building burned down and then that became a big deal. And then, so now we're into Sunday and Sunday there was a big uh, demonstration on the front campus. And uh, at that demonstration, uh, the National Guard uh, in formation with fixed bayonets. They, uh, they tear gas people, they drove them off of the front campus. A few people got minor pokes with the, so there was, there'd already been like three days of, of, of tension uh, involving. And then of course, the morning of May 4th dawns and it was, it was, it was like one of these uh, supernaturally perfect spring days. The, the lilacs were blooming all over. So the, the entire campus smelled like lilacs and the sun was out and there was a balmy breeze and spring had sprung. Uh, now, they, they didn't cancel classes. There was, the, you know, it was just another day on campus except there were National Guard uh, with, you know, armored personnel carriers and jeeps and stuff like that on campus. So uh, at 12 o'clock, uh, um, some, some protesters started ringing the, the victory bell, which they would ring uh, after the um, um, infrequent football victories. Uh, and there was a, a protest to, to bury the constitution because we had expanded the war. We had started a war with Cambodia without uh, Congress declaring war. You know, it was an executive action on on the part of the of uh, the Nixon administration. So, twelve o'clock comes. People are gathered to hear to hear some speeches. There's probably 25, 1,500 to 2,500 like active protesters out on the field. And then there's probably another three to 4,000 students watching. And then there's all the other students that are like going to class or coming from class. And there were, you know, 20,000 students on campus now. So, so there's a lot of people there. Well, in the middle of that, the, uh, the head of the National Guard drives out in a Jeep with a bullhorn and he says, um, we're declaring this a state of emergency. Uh, you have to disperse. And so, I mean, classes are still on. They, there's been no announcement from the university and he's saying, and so far the protests had been entirely peaceful. And all of a sudden they're saying, wait a minute, we're going to impinge on your constitutional right to, uh, petition the government uh, for redress of grievances, uh, and we're basically going to boss you around. So the students didn't leave. So the National Guard started shooting tear gas at the students. Well, the problem was, it was a balmy spring, windy day in May. And you shoot the tear gas and the tear gas blows away. So they would shoot the tear gas canister and some student would pick it up and throw it back. So that went on for, for 20 minutes or so. And then somebody gets, you know, the bright idea to actually send troops against the students. And what happened was a, a group of about a hundred, they go forward and the students just parted and let them march through. They marched up uh, Taylor Hill, where the architecture building is, where, where all the kind of famous photos are. And they marched over the hill and down the other side. And then they came to a fenced in practice football field and there was no place for the guard to go. So then they, and by this time they're out of tear gas. So they turn around, they start marching back up the hill. And once again, the students parted, let them march over the hill, and then they just kind of filled in. So when they come back up, once again, the students started, started parting. And I went to the right 
and Jerry kind of went to the left. Uh, and where, where I went was over by uh, one of the residence halls. Jerry went toward the, uh, the parking lot at Taylor Hall. And when the guard got back up to the top of the hill at Taylor Hall, they suddenly turned in unison and opened fire. And they opened fire in the direction that Jerry had gone. So he was, he was around uh, a lot of the people that got shot. Now, uh, the, some of the guard actually took aim. Others just kind of shot in the air because bullets went into apartment buildings a half a mile away. Uh, because the M1 is lethal up to one mile away. So, uh, so four people were killed, including Sandy Scheuer. Now, Sandy Scheuer was a uh, speech therapy student. She was walking out of a class 150, 150 yards away and a bullet went into her throat and she was dead. Uh, so, um, As we said earlier, that was the tipping point because I think had it not been for that event, I know my personal plan was um, I'd already started taking some graduate level anthropology courses and I was gonna get a master's degree in anthropology and then probably a PhD. And you know, I wanted uh, 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 to wind up in, Af in, in Africa digging up uh, uh, bones in Olduvai Gorge. And I, I think, Jerry, I think Jerry probably, uh, he hadn't graduated yet, but I, he was planning on getting an, an MFA. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I thought he would wind up either as like a creative director at an ad agency or doing some kind of graphics or stuff like that. I, you know, I don't think that either of us would have wound up where we wound up had it not been for that. That kind of changed changed everybody's plans utterly. Right. So all of a sudden, the aforementioned kind of loose artistic aggregate that's doing this kind of doing music and kind of doing art and kind of doing this all of a sudden as a focus. Yeah. And, and, and an angry focus. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think that kind of plus uh, um, when, when, when you're going to school and they shoot at you, it kind of changes your uh, your relationship with the institution, and that's where that's where I would also like to uh, uh, come back to the uh, Ron Roskins, who was the provo, because interesting story about Ron. After after Kent State, he left Kent and he was named the chancellor at the University of Nebraska. And about, so he was there for a while, but about eight to 10 years later, there was this thing called the Franklin Loan Scandal. And in the course of investigating the Franklin Loan Scandal, all sorts of really kind of seamy stuff came out, including the fact that, so Roskins winds up getting fired by the Board of Regents of the University of Nebraska because he was apparently he had a, a homosexual recruitment ring to recruit young boys for the CIA. Yeah, so, but he, and so he does get fired at the University of Nebraska, but then oddly enough, he gets named as the head of USAID, the US United States Aid to International Development, which, functions as a front for the CIA. You know, you send people in on uh, chamber of commerce style, business to business relationships in foreign countries, but it's really a, like the USAID was very much uh, involved in the overthrow of the Ukrainian government. When, when the pro-Putin guy got thrown out, that was pretty much a right-wing coup that USAID and the CIA had dumped about $30 million into, into getting that guy out. Now, he may have deserved getting out, but once again, USAID is still like 
part and parcel of the CIA. Now, and so it appeared that Roskins had a pre-existing relation with uh, the CIA prior to, prior to May 4th. And that indeed, uh, part of his whole thing of recruiting stooges and snitches was, you know, some of that information was actually going to, to the CIA. And I mention this because there's another link here. And we talked about uh, Professor Robert Bertoff, who was sponsored Devo at the Creative Arts Festival. And really, he, he went out of his way to help us in every way possible. Well, a couple of weeks after May 4th, I get a call from Bertoff and he says, are you going downtown tonight? I said, oh, I hadn't played. He said, don't go downtown tonight. And I said, well, what's the deal? And so let me give you a little bit of background on this. Bertoff grew up in uh, Troy, New York, and then he went to he went to Bowdoin College in Maine to play hockey. So uh, we've got like you know an expensive, exclusive, uh, small private school. He's playing hockey there, and then uh, he goes to the University of Oregon. He gets his master's and his PhD under uh, Kingsley Weatherhead, and then he uh, he's writing his dissertation on. Uh, this Chinese poet who lives in Taiwan. So he goes to Taiwan to, to interview this guy and talk to him. And after he's done, he's there for like a week or two. And then on his way back, he goes through Hong Kong. So he checks into this hotel in Hong Kong and he's in the lobby and the elevator doors open and out comes a guy on crutches. And he looks up and it's a guy that he'd played hockey with at Bowdoin. So he goes, uh, you know, hey, Joe. And he goes, hey, Bob, how you doing? Let's, you know, let's have a drink. And then, you know, he winds up asking, hey, uh, what's the story? How come you're on crutches? And the guy's story was after they've had a few drinks is that he had been inside communist China on a mission and getting out had taken a shot in his leg <laughs> as he was escaping from China working for the CIA. So, you know, they, they catch up on old times and that's pretty, you know, that's the end of that story, except a couple weeks after May 4th, Bertoff's walking down the street. He's going down to the butcher boy uh, butcher shop. He's walking down the street and he sees the same guy walking down the street toward him. Except this time, the guy won't make eye contact and does not acknowledge his existence. I was going to say that's a bad omen right there. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I will, I will forever remain convinced that um, Kent State was not as simple an accident uh, as it may appear. And that indeed, uh, somebody in the White House or close to it may have actually called the shots and said, you know, if we shoot a couple of these college kids. And because I find it interesting that, I mean, we're, I think we're all more aware of white privilege and white entitlement than we were 20, 40 years ago. Because we, we were inside of it and we benefited from it uh, in a way. So you don't necessarily really notice the fact that how come everything good happens to you guys and that. And, uh, but uh, I would point out that on May 4th, there weren't any Black United students on campus because those guys know when the National Guard shows up, they got, you know, they got bullets in the chamber and they're prepared to pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so it, 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 in that, it was kind of, it was kind of eye opening. And if it hadn't been for uh, Professor Glenn Frank, who was a very popular geology professor, flat top ex Marine sergeant, probably the most popular professor on campus because he could make geology interesting. Uh, he was one of the uh, faculty marshals during May 4th. And after the shooting, there were a 1,500 students came back and did a sit-in right about 20 yards from the National Guard. And the National Guard was getting prepared to move them. And 
uh, I was close enough to actually hear this exchange. Frank ran up to the to the brigadier, Brigadier General Canterbury, and he said, "You can't do this. It'll be a massacre." And and uh, Canterbury says, "You got five minutes to get him the hell out of here." So he turned around and gave an impassioned speech with tears running down his face, saying, "I understand your anger. I understand, but I'm begging you." please leave, go home, get out of here. And the students listened to him. And if that had not happened, there might've been 100, 200 more killed because they were, they were, the guard was ready to like ready aim fire. Mm -hmm. So, it, I mean, it was really that close. And uh, uh, it's, it's uh, one guy actually saved a bunch of people's lives then. By by seizing seizing the moment and taking action. Yeah, we well, you know, you know everything. Everything you just related, the entire twisted story. The whole time I'm thinking is one of the key tenets of Devo, and that is opposites and rebellion are obsolete. Yes, it's, I, it's I, contraries, I, not opposites. Right, right, and that that really helps one to understand exactly what that means. So, I mean, that, that hopefully that gives people some kind of background on kind of the, the charged politics of the moment. Right, which Devo was very much a part of because if I recall correctly, Jerry was actually a member of the SDS, the Students for Democratic Society. And May 4th really turned his head around and I would imagine yours as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, uh, as I told, I knew the SDS guys and basically what I told them was, um, if you need me to drive a getaway car, I am ready, but I can't come and sit through the meetings. <laughs> because, you know, the meetings were just like, you know, any other meetings. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really interesting because after all that, it really does give that focus for Devo's activities because, okay, we've already seen that if you try to have a march or a sit-in or whatever, they're not gonna put up with it. But if you get more insidious- If you, you gotta infiltrate. Right. And, and, uh, and you know, a quick aside too, it, it's like, I mean, when there's school shootings now, everybody gets counseling. Uh, we didn't get no counseling. We didn't get no nothing. And um, I, I mean, I think part of the part of the the impetus for Devo is, it, I mean, it's almost a a form of PTSD. It was, you know, it was a way to try to act out because because um, you know, Jerry often says, you know, I was, just, you know, I was I was just a a sweet hippie, and then and and there was that. Jerry after May 4th was not the same as, as Jerry. He was more focused, more angry, and more determined. Right. I was going to, I was going to speculate that maybe, I don't know if he was always a bitter kind of a guy, but I would think after something like that, definitely. Right. Right. Bitter. Yeah. Cause that bitterness really informs everything Devo has ever done when you get right down to it. And um, to the point of actually turning off. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought actually we, I thought it might've been smart to, to try to, to, to try to have a ballad because if you want to sell records, ballads sell records, man. Yeah. Well, see, now that's interesting because that's, that's where it gets into the whole, like the, the larger picture of the Kent version of Devo versus what I'll just call the Akron version of Devo the Kent version of Devo was so informed by Jerry's worldview and his experiences and that bitterness that it really probably did not have much of a chance in the marketplace. Right. Whereas the Akron version, where you're able to sugarcoat the pill a little bit with the, as you said, musical facility of the Mother's Boss and putting mark out front who you know kind of goofy kind of silly i mean the message is still the same it's still as heavy and deep and bitter as it always was but it's a, it's a little bit less of a punch in the mouth 
Well, yeah, and I'm, I mean, actually, there were like, there were some songs that Mark came up with that really kind of like got under, got under Jerry's skin. I, like, uh, I think I'm falling in love again. <laughs> Jerry did not, he did not, you know, was, and even come back Johnny and uh, uh, bottled up, which I always thought bottled up should have been released because that, that pop fizz thing, that's a hook. Yeah. That was a hook. Great. I mean, tune. in the same way that that uh, Emerson Lake and Palmer, when they did Lucky Man, the original release of Lucky Man didn't have the synthesizer on it. Mm. You know, it was just like a. In fact, it was the first song Greg Lake ever wrote in his mm. life. He just got the guitar. He knew four chords. He used the four chords, but but then when they had the added the Moog at the end. Uh, but you know, it completely changed the song, and you know, it took off. And uh, I thought that Bottle Up, and of course, there might have been a really good tie-in with Seven Up. I thought too, but it, right. <laughs> it's now, of course, everybody doesn't write a song unless they've got a sponsor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting that you would mention "Think I'm Falling in Love Again" because I always thought that was um, to coin a phrase, just kind of a piss take on a real love song. Do you think that was like an actual authentic love song he wrote? No, 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 no. But it, but it was, it was the, the silliness, I think, of it that irritated Jerry. Right, right. I can see he that. It could be a bit didactical. Right. One of my, I think my favorite example of a song that we can actually compare iterations with is Fraulein. You look at the original Kent version of Fraulein, which is just the endlessly repeating bass like do 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 for about six minutes while Jerry delivers this toneless monotonous monologue about the gas station while Jungle Jim beats those bizarre sounding electronic drums and Mark's just making really strange synthesizer sounds. Yes. But then you go to the later version with Alan Myers on drums and Mark playing a little bit of Raymond Scott on the keyboard. Oh, man, and then, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then Jerry Jazz, and Mark kind of, it up a little bit. Yeah. And it's it's a huge difference because most people wouldn't find the Kent version palatable at all. Whereas the Akron version is really catchy in its own yeah. bizarre way. Well, and you know, uh there was there was um Another song uh, kind of like that, I had come up with this chord progression. It was, I think it was uh, D minor, A minor, C, B, A. And Jerry wrote a song, um, All of Us, to that. Mm -hmm. or, or no, sun, sun Go Down, Moon Come Up, Do I Do Right or Wrong? But then later, that becomes the last time I saw St. Louis. It's just, but it was, it's the same chord progression, but way, way speeded up. Right. And that, that's another, in my opinion, one of the great lost songs from Devo. Just for whatever reason, this kind of fell by the wayside. Never even, they never even recorded that one in the studio, did they? No, no. It, it, uh, the only recording is either a practice recording or you know a demo. Yeah, there's there's a couple of live versions too. I think there's one from Eagle Street Saloon. Um, oh, that, that brought back a memory. I can tell. Oh, but well, Eagle Street was just it was so. The guy that ran it was so sketchy. It was it it's where the Indians Indians new stadium is now, so it does not exist anymore. But the guy that ran the place. He, I don't need, he didn't even have, I don't think he had a license because there were no uh, refrigeration in it and there were no like draft things. He would buy cans of beer and coolers. And that, that, that you know, that was the alcohol. And um, so we, and, 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 you know, and it was just, it was the grungiest, most terrible. It, it was as dirty as CBGB's, but it was in Cleveland. So it was, comparatively worse um and so we've played there the first time the first time it, it didn't work out that bad but the second time um halfway through the first set now there's no light so so general jacket and i have got like uh clamp lights on extension cords 
holding, we're in the audience holding them so you can see the guys on stage. And unbeknownst to us, this group of bikers enters the bar. And so, um, and DeVoe's playing music and DeVoe playing music and, and bikers in like 1977, 78, it's probably not a good idea. And so they began to take exception to the music. They wanted to hear some Leonard Skinner or something like that. And uh, so, and I didn't really know what was going on because I'm down front holding the light and General's holding the light. And so I'm there and somebody kicks my hand that's holding the light. And the light goes up in the air and I just kind of like turn around and shove the guy. And it was like this little biker. And he was already like shit faced. So he just kind of fell down. And then that was the end of the set. So I went outside to have a smoke. And as I get ready to go back in, like three people come up to me and say, hey, you can't go back in there. They're looking at you, they're gonna kill you. And I said, who, what are you talking? And so they say, no, there's all these bikers. And just then these uh, four squad cars pull up and these, Cleveland police guys get out and it looked like they had been like injection molded out of the same mold. They were all about 5'11", 225 with, with billy clubs and they just went in and beat the brutal piss out of the bike. They were looking for an excuse to beat up bikers. So we did escape, uh, escape with our lives, but I think that was the last time we played Eagle Street. No, I do. I actually, I have some. I have some memorabilia. Uh, I wanted to share here. Let me see if I can find some. Okay, this is this is the program for the first Creative Arts Festival. Ooh, that would be Devo's world concert world debut. There. Yes. Yes, and then inside was this photo, and the label is a typical sextet Devo audience. And it just so happens I also have the original photo that we used in that. Bunch of frightened children. This is a uh, this is a concert poster uh, from the Drome. Johnny John Thompson, who. I think we talked about him last time. He worked with uh, Perubu and he had the record store in, in Cleveland. He, he sponsored this. Johnny Dromet and Clee Magazine present Devo, Special Attraction, the movie, The Truth About De-Evolution, uh, and from Ann Arbor, Destroy All Monsters played with us, and then also a local band called the Styrene Money Band. That is Saturday night, December 3rd. I don't know what year. I, in fact, I should probably look that up because if I, if I type it, you know, I can find out what years December third was on a Saturday. It's 1977. Oh, oh, you, you already know. Look at I'm, that. I'm a fanboy. I can't help it. These facts oh are God. permanently ingrained in my brain. This is, I believe, my favorite Devo graphic of all time. The four guys with the uh, uh, photographs taken in the you know, the four photos for a dollar booth and then put over the trousers. Wow, that's that's a theme that they revisited on the back of the the day my baby, my baby gave me a surprise single with the legs. Yes, this is the uh, original lyrics for Be Stiff. Oh, yeah, look at that. Lewis and Casali, that's you. Uh, Wait, was that your handwriting? Were you in charge of actually writing down all the lyrics? Uh, no, it's somebody else's. I, it, in fact, it looks to be like maybe Bobby Watson. And then there's some places where, where I had to fill it in because she didn't know what it, it was. But it's, it's, it's nicer writing than either Jerry or I had. Uh, here's, here's one, uh, a poster for the uh, this was a um, a benefit for Shelley's, which was a poetry group group uh, uh, that met in uh, Shelley's book bar, and uh, they also published the magazine where uh, Jerry and and Mark and I 
were given like large sections to do kind of Devo propaganda. Here's a happy, happy photo of the boys. And I believe this is in the uh, rubber museum at Goodyear. Uh, here's one. A new twist for uh, a new 45 for Devo. I don't know which 45 this referred to. Perhaps, perhaps the one with social fools and sloppy on it. Oh, here's one. This is the poster for the 1977 New Year's Eve. Uh, I may have an extra one of that. Would you like one of these? Yes, please. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I got extras on that. Uh, Oh, and then this is the the famous gorge card, and I will read the if you don't mind. I will read the uh, the prayer which I actually wrote. Uh, so this is gorge. You who were not always thus, hear our prayer. You who were once of us, but knew the womb of she, the evil one. You whose devoluted image calls to us within the house of pain who promised us that he who venerates holy union be granted the sacrament of pole and hole. Glub, glub, O oh pleasant liquid slapping. You, forced to float in black space with broken tether and doomed to suffer eternally the agony of fixed pelvis. O oh gorge, who were once as us, but changed. Now disdaining the sleepers, nuns, rich men, hippies, rubber workers, you avenging one, defiler of the cleft of creation, guide us through the mysteries shrouding fuck love bliss. Amen. It's beautiful, beautiful. And then here, of, of course, is your, this was a badly printed one where they misregistered the, uh, the lyrics. So it was a, a factory second. Somewhere I've got the plates for, for printing those covers because they were printed, they were printed two up. So they would have been like, you know, that big. And then two up, and then we would hand cut them with a cutter before folding. This is a, oh yes, this was the satisfaction sloppy one. This is a pretty nice one. Yes, the uh, the UK sleeve actually. Oh, here's here's a, an invite. Have I got good news for you? Uh, it's uh, postmarked January 1975. It's for Mark. Mark had a uh, print show at the Packard Gallery in in Akron. Uh, the much more everybody knows this one. Yep, the U.S. pressing. And then this is. Bobby Watson's photo from CBGB's. And now this is uh, La Pièce de Résistance. This is, now the kids won't, kids nowadays won't understand, but this says Western Union up here and it's a pale yellow envelope. And inside is this curious piece of paper that says uh, from London, BLTX. Bob Lewis, 2267 15th Street, Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. Bob, everything progressing with great ease and a lot of hard work. I badly need Bougie Boy poster, artwork, the film, and also artwork for the satisfaction bag. Many thanks, Paul Conroy, Stiff Records. And that's February 2nd, 1978. And then accompanying that was this thing here, which says, Sent to Bob Lewis, British pressing. So this was the test pressing for B Stiff's uh, release of B Stiff in England. This is, as far as I know, this is a the only one that exists in the universe. Well, the record geek in me right now is having a real conniption fit. Let me tell you. Well, how much is this worth? Because I have no idea. I'll Anything give you a dollar. I'll give you a dollar. A one dollar. dollar. Give you a dollar. It's an old 45, you, you probably didn't pay a dollar for it. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they sent it to you for free, right? Give That's you right, it was like 50 years ago. What are you bitching about? <laughs> so anyway. That's great. 
<laughs> very, very cool. Well, I'm going to, that might be a good time for us to uh, knock this episode on of the That's good because, you know, I have dog responsibilities yet. Yeah, that some things never change. So that was awesome. I would love to come back for more because I still got questions and I have a feeling that you still have answers. Oh, yeah, I would be more than happy. So uh, uh, keep in touch and we will we will schedule another session. Absolutely. And while Bob is going off to walk the dog, I'm just going to remind her to remind everybody to always look at my live Facebook broadcasts Wednesday at 7 p.m. It's Tent Talks Tunes and also the Malcolm Tent Shoot Interviews. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Discogs and eBay. I'm on every platform there is, baby. So don't miss me and don't miss Bob Lewis next time that we talk. Bob, thank you so much. Thank you, Malcolm. And until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.